Good morning, Emmanuel. My name is Leah Wilkening, and it's my pr privilege to be with you again this morning. Before we begin, let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would send your spirit to guide us this morning, that your spirit would speak directly into our hearts. Lord, let your voice be louder than all the others, including my own. Lord, we only want to hear from you and what you have for us this morning. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. We're continuing our Pentecost celebration. Pentecost is a time to remember that God is the source of all life. We remember the day that Christ's spirit fell on the new church. Last week, we talked about two aspects of baptism, forgiveness and new life, and how that baptism connects us to that day of Pentecost, that day when the church first began. We concentrated on the forgiveness part of baptism, the forgiveness on which Jesus built his new church. And we talked about how, the, how baptism washes us with the Spirit. This week we focus on God's purpose. Why does he do it? We talk about the new life that comes alongside forgiveness. We head to the Old Testament today, long before that day when the Spirit fell upon the early church. We head to Psalm 104. It's a psalm that, since the early church, has been read at Pentecost. It's known as the Pentecost Psalm. It has references to God's life-giving Spirit, and that's why it was read. But it has more to tell us. Psalm 104 reminds us in the midst of every moment, whether it's a Pentecost celebration or just an average Tuesday, that God is the giver of new life through his spirit. This morning, we remember that God's spirit seals us for a purpose. We're sealed for life. Let's turn to our scripture this morning, Psalm 104. Praise the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The waters stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned for them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they ever cover the earth. He makes springs pour water over the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirsts. The birds of the air nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The earth is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. Wine that gladdens the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread that sustains his heart. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. There the birds make their nests, the stork has its home in the pine trees. The high mountains belong to the wild goats, the crags are a refuge for the conies. The moon marks off the seasons, and the sun knows when to go down. You bring darkness, it becomes night, and all the beasts of the forest prowl. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. The sun rises and they steal away. They return and lie down in their dens. Then man goes out to his work, to his labor until evening. How many are your works, O Lord! In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. There the ships go to and fro, and the Leviathan, which you form to frolic there. These all look to you, to give them their food at the proper time. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are satisfied with good things. When you hide your face, they're terrified. When you take away their breath, they die and return to the dust. When you send your spirit, they're created. And you renew the face of the earth. 
May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him as I rejoice in the Lord. But may sinners vanish from the earth and the wicked be no more. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Now you may have noticed that there are times throughout this psalm where it moves from speaking to the Lord and speaking of the Lord. This text is both a conversation within and between a community and God. It's a statement of faith and praise. Scholar J. Clinton McCann Jr. locates this psalm within the greater structure of the Psalter, and he thinks it would have likely encouraged the Israelites in the midst of crisis. Now to understand the images that this psalm evoke and what they would have evoked for ancient Israel as they would have listened to this psalm be recited by memory, it's important to go to the psalms around it to understand it a little more. Psalm 103 and Psalm 104 together form a pair that set the listener's mind to a simple time, one where everything can be known about God through his creation and the way he provides for his creation. To get a fuller sense of what this means, though, to ancient Israel, we can see Psalm 103 and 104 in the context of Psalm 101 and 102. Psalm 102 gives us a clear vision of exactly what this psalm is, is responding to. Psalm 101 and 102 describe destruction. Psalm 102 tells us exactly what historical event that destruction was. The historical event remembered in this section of the Psalter is of the destruction of the nation of Israel, also known as Zion. When Jerusalem is overtaken and God's people are taken as prisoners on a death march to Babylon. The Babylonian exile is a blow to Israel. The temple lay in ruins. The monarchy of David's line is deposed in humiliation. The entire nation is deported from the land God gave them. They're driven from the promised land. To Israel, God's embodied rule on earth, what they could see and feel and touch, what they came to depend on, seemingly collapses as the invaders roll into town. The Babylonian exile is more than a national crisis to Israel. It's, it's a crisis of faith. It's almost as if you could hear the whole nation in a collective groan saying, what is going on in the world? Now think of Psalm 104 being read in the upper room after Jesus' crucifixion on that day of Easter. It's an event that Christ followers cannot forget. All seemed lost. The temple curtain, curtain torn in two. The entire nation still in oppression by Rome when the body of their Messiah the one who was supposed to save them who was supposed to set all things right the king that is God's embodied rule on earth broken I can imagine in the upper room the disciples sitting in agony and hopelessness at Jesus crucifixion before he walked in in their crisis of faith, I can imagine they may have groaned, what is going on in the world? And Psalm 104 speaks into Pentecost. That day, after Christ's body, his resurrected body, was returned to the heavens, there sat his followers, up in that upper room once again, sitting in the uncertainty of what's next. He's transformed, and yet everything on earth is the same for them. They have no idea of what, what's coming. They have no idea that soon the Spirit's winds of power and tongues of fire will descend on them and, and give them incredible new life. But in the moment where they're waiting, 
They are in that just upper room once again in constant prayer, trying to figure out how to replace Judas the betrayer. As a violent wind begins to come through the whole house, I can imagine their collective wonder might be what is going on in the world. There are events in life when we groan, what is going on in the world? We may be feeling it now. We wonder if, when enough vaccines are going to get here. When the church will gather in person again. When and what losses our kids will feel when this is all over. We may wonder what the rebuilding of the economy will look like. And when life will ever get back to the way it once was. Some of us have been searching for new life in the midst of a crisis for a while now, long before the pandemic. In the political tensions of our day, we may groan collectively, what is going on in the world? Last summer in Parham, Ontario, a hamlet north of Kingston, the community experienced one of those unforgettable moments. Smoke began to fill the tiny town center. A man who lived in the old rectory of St. James Anglican Church had set fire to his home and to the old beautiful chapel next door. And when neighbors came out to see what was going on and if they could help, that man shot at people that he knew by name. When all was said and done and the day was over, two residents were shot and there was nothing left of the ornate little chapel its front door, this beautiful robin egg blue, stood precariously underneath a collapsing, crumbling steeple. The church membership of only a dozen or so faithful saints made it through hard times as a congregation before they would fundraise when the roof needed repair or somehow make it work every year when the budget came. Immediately after the fire, a town resident sat in front of the burned out shell and began reading the New Testament. He returned the next day and the next day and he said, once there is an understanding and a sense of peace in this community and that the sorrow is washed away, I'll keep coming here. In the smoldering wreckage, many across the nation joined his groan, his community's groan, and asked, what is going on in the world? Throughout history, God reminds his people of his life-giving purpose. When Israel encounters the burning embers of Jerusalem as they're driven from the city, or when the disciples are in the upper room remembering Jesus' broken body on the cross, or when the remnant of new believers are sitting in that same upper room after ascension waiting for the Spirit, Psalm 104 turns our eyes to a time where God is not limited to a city where there is no temple before King David or had a monarchy or, or any, there was no King David line or before a time when there were no kings of Israel. And in that time, the days of Moses, their, prayer, their praise is basic. When his creation and rule over the cosmos is the only evidence they need of his goodness, they find praise nevertheless. God brings order to their chaos by drawing their attention to his artistry and ingenuity. He sets the boundaries, verse 8, of raging waters and making them flow into ravines and into places he assigns. Verses 11 and 13, these same waters quench the thirst of wild donkeys and provide sanctuary and, for the birds and, and food. He reminds them how the nourished land then feeds the cattle and produces the food and wine to gladden human hearts, verses 13 and 15. God as creator and sustainer breathes his life-giving breath into the plants that feed the creatures and those that house the birds. He gives life to the oil and bread that makes faces shine, verse 15, and hearts full. Verses 19, he creates order, order out of chaos with the predictable rhythms of the sun and the moon. Verse 35, even the wicked and sinners are left into God's capable hands. 
How can we have room for much worry over sinners and wick wickedness with our minds set on the work of the beasts and the fields and the birds in the sky? God's interconnected perspective allows Israel to glorify God in the midst of every chaos. His cosmic perspective allows the disciples to walk in faith with the risen Jesus, sharing the, go the gospel and persecution. And this same breath sets the church on fire for the life of the world. Pentecost is a time when God reminds us that we're, we're sealed for a purpose, for life. Our baptism seals us, connecting us to God's purpose of all time, starting new life into us. God gives us his perspective, placing us within his garden to care and be cared for. In the weeks after the St. James Anglican Church fire, the smell of smoke in the air began to dissipate. Parishioner Daniel Meter wrote an essay for the Reform Journal. In his grief, he remembers the communion of saints and who we call the brave little steeple, and remembering the unconscious dance of our ritual of doing life together. Hear these words of his essay, I love the place where your glory dwells. Pay attention to the way he connects the life of the church with the life of the world. I love the way the kingbird feeds by acrobatics from the trees along the lake. She lunges from her branch above the water to snatch what I can't see or plunges down and curls around the bug she catches. I love the way Levi takes communion at the rail. I kneel as he stands next to me. Stocky, ruddy, ancient, undistracted, with his hands cupped out and his eyes half-closed. On Sunday, I drank the cup of salvation from the hands that gave me the sweet corn. Well, we had just prayed for Eucharistic thanks for creation and salvation. The bread of angels and bread for the birds. Well, it's corn for the ducks from the hands of Fred, whose cottage is across the cove. I love how the mallards come down from the air, gliding in at the great speed past my shore, necks up, tails down, feet lowered, wings recurved, rolling right to the round point, like they can feel how gifted is their flight. O oh Lord, how manifold are your creatures. In wisdom you have made them all. In the chaos, Meter remembers his beloved church, now just a skeleton. The birds in the sky and the peoples in the pew are intertwined in this unconscious dance of ritual. And when he reflects on all of it, all of the creation, it lifts his eyes from the ashes of destruction around him in praise of Creator. After the fire, the town begins to gather around one another. The pastor and victims speak words of forgiveness and they offer prayers to the man who set the town on fire. The victims' wounds are mostly flesh. They heal quickly, but the inner wounds take longer. And the skeletal remains of the building plot, as verse 30 declares in our text, the Lord continues to send his spirit. The communion of saints created again. God renews the face of the ground. Some of us feel we're in a moment of history with so much loss and chaos. We groan what's going on in the world. Psalm 104.30 says, when you send your spirit. This Pentecost, God breathes his spirit on us again, drawing our face from skeletal remains of church services canceled, good plans interrupted, scattered, communion of saints throughout the towns. And he breathes winds of power and flames of purity into the dirge of winter death and the dark nights of the soul. And he renews his people and his church. He sets our perspective on the flourishing creation that bursts with life all around us. And as sure as the sun rises, the Spirit creates new life in us again. There's only one response to God's glorious grace. Our praise. We are sealed for life. Would you repeat these statements of faith and praise from Psalm 104? Would you say them with me? I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing to the Lord all my life. 
I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for bringing our eyes away from the earthly uh, moments this week and lifting our heads above the clouds to see your creation all around us. Thank you for lifting our heads above the ashes, for seeing the life that your spirit brings us. Your spirit gives us new life and sets a new face on the ground, Lord. And so we thank you for the way that you um, allow us to worship you today. And we pray that the rest of this week we might look around at creation and we might see you, Lord. See you and connect and be connected by your spirit through the to the early church and to your people of all time. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Bless the Lord. Amen. Go now with the Lord's blessing to serve and worship our God. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he turn his face towards you and give you his peace. By the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.